Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the worship services of the First Congregational Church of South Peak, and we are so glad that you could be with us today. Uh, we are gathered virtually, as we have for just over a year now, and we have gathered on Easter Sunday morning. So if you're with us live, we're so grateful that you could join us to join us either via audio or audio and visual uh, to worship with us as we listen to songs this morning. We've shared with one another, we've prayed with one another, and now we're entering into our time of, of actually delivering a message and praying with one another as a, as a, a broader church body. And for those of you that are joining us on the recording, we appreciate that as well, whether you're doing it uh, multiple times for uh, ongoing study, or maybe you just couldn't be here on Sunday morning and you wanted to catch the message. Either way, we appreciate the fact that you have joined us this morning. And by God's spirit, by his great and infinite power, we're actually coming together in community. Uh, in addition to coming together uh, in spirit, we are also going to be taking communion this morning, so I would encourage you uh, to find something uh, around you, whether it be something to break so we can break bread together or something that, and something that we can drink so that we can take the cup together. We'll be doing that at the end of our service today. As we do each week, we will be praying with one another, we'll bring a message with one another, and we'll be listening, for, hearing from God's word. Let's start by turning in our Bibles to John chapter 1. In this particular sermon series we've been going through, we've been reading the same scripture passage as our scripture reading on purpose, intentionally, because there is power and strength in repetition. And so we're reading out of John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Because our sermon series is about Jesus, let's read about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I'm going to reread that word, that sentence. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Again, that is John chapter 1. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine. Thank you for the warming temperatures. Thank you for the greening grass. Thank you, Father, for the reminder that you are in control and that new life comes out of the death of seed. Father, thank you for the renewed spirit that we have in the spring season. And thank you, Father, for the Easter season this time in the church calendar that, that brings our hearts and our minds into even more clear attention to all that you have done for this world and bringing your son. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your infinite grace and mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. As we have noted a couple times already this morning, it is Easter Sunday a day traditionally filled with fancy dresses and Easter bonnets and ham dinners. And even though we worship and sing and gather most every Sunday to honor God, there's almost always a different vibe in the air at church on Easter Sunday. It's more crowded than usual. That's one thing. 
It's one of the big two that bring out the tertiary crowd to church. Many up their wardrobe game just a bit. Some attend services literally at the crack of dawn, and some serve special breakfasts. And preachers, we will usually do one of two things. On the one hand, we might pull out our standard Easter sermon, the one that we preach every single year, or we will go all out to try to make that day's sermon extra special as if it were the Super Bowl of Sunday morning services because we know the big crowds are coming out. This year, though, similar to last, we find ourselves in a unique place this Easter 2021. No bigger crowds, no Easter bonnets, and no church breakfasts. We continue to meet virtually, and it's safe to say that some of us are probably still in our pajamas. We've come to a place where we accept the necessity of this arrangement, but I think it's healthy to at least articulate its distinction from a normal Easter year. And as far as today's message is concerned, we find ourselves toward the end of a sermon series that was not at all designed around the Easter season. However, I'm, I'm literally in awe of how God has aligned today's message with the church calendar. I assure you this is by his doing and not by mine. But I must warn you, this is not your typical Feel good Easter message. As I noted in the email that I send each Sunday morning and on our Facebook page, this is not your father's Easter Day message. Some of you are not going to like it very much. That's okay, though. We need to hear the hard stuff from God sometimes. As many of you know, we are in the midst of a sermon series called Everyday Jesus. It's based on John Eldridge's book, Beautiful Outlaw. Pete Briscoe started us off by introducing us to the kitchen window. That's what those of you that are watching visually can see behind me. That's why there's a kitchen window behind me. The basic idea is that all, we all have a very limited view of Jesus based on our experiences thus far in our lives. In week two, we enjoyed the fact that there's a childlike playfulness in the character of Jesus. In week three, we looked at the side of Jesus that was extravagantly generous in week four, we observed how Jesus was disruptively honest. We say something when we see something if we love someone. And last week, we noted something a little deeper in his character, that he was unashamedly scandalous. He would, without exception, rather help the people in need than impress the people in power. And our aim in this series is to intentionally stretch our understanding of Jesus, to in introduce additional elements to his character, to fill out his personality, to bring life and breadth and depth to an otherwise one or two dimensional character we read about in the pages of the Bible, to get beyond our limited kitchen window view and to see a broader scope of who Jesus was. And today on this Easter Sunday, I'd like us to consider something that I believe the American church in particular misses completely, almost to the point of negligence. And that's the fact that Jesus was strategically cunning. What were you doing in 2006? At that time, I was working in a corporate law department of all places. We were, we were rolling out a big initiative, and I was responsible for developing the training. Our family lived in Elmwood at the time, and my commute was 70 miles each way. I was in the car between an hour and 10, an hour and 15, just to go to work and then to come home from work. I was working four tens at the time. I loved my three-day weekends, but those work days were long. Anna was six. It was the year that we as a family, our entire family on my side, when my brother and sister and their family and my mom and dad and our family went to Disney. <clears throat> I 
The fact that there was a war going on in Iraq could not have been further from my mind or from my experience. Earlier this year, I read a leadership book called Extreme Ownership. It was written by two Navy SEALs, and suffice it to say, they did not go to Disney that year. They were in Ramadi, Iraq, with their SEAL team, Task Force Bruiser. And they were charged with securing one of the most brutal, infested vestiges of Al-Qaeda. Every day, they would leave the relative safety of their camp. They would enter into enemy territory, swarming with insurgents that wanted nothing less than to kill them. And then they would, be engaged, they would engage with the enemy. Their charge, their commander's intent, was to rid the enemy stronghold of its evil element. And to do that, they had to operate behind enemy lines from page 93 of the book. We fought an evil enemy, perhaps as evil as any the US military had faced in its long history. These violent jihadis used torture, rape, and murder as weapons to ruthlessly terrorize, intimidate, and rule over the civilian populace who lived in abject fear. The American public and much of the Western world lived in willful naivete of the barbaric, unspeakable tactics these jihadis employed. It was subhuman savagery. Having witnessed this repeatedly in our minds and those of the people who suffered under the bu their brutal, brutal reign, the Muj deserved no mercy. My family and I were enjoying a parade outside of Cinderella's castle about this time. I mentioned that this was a leadership book. The authors used combat scenarios and their experiences to teach leaders how to think and strategize in the heat of battle, how to remain clear headed and keep their troops on mission, how to succeed when resources were practically non-existent and how to stay alive when the enemy is literally hiding around every corner wanting otherwise. Now about now you may be asking what in the world does this have to do with the character of Jesus, let alone Easter? Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 10 verse 16. Jesus is sending the 12 out on mission. They're not going to the Gentiles or, to the, or into Samaria on this trip. Jesus is very specific. Their mission is to go to the lost sheep of Israel, and they're to do a few things. They are to proclaim the message. They are to heal the sick. They are to raise the dead, and they are to drive out demons. That is their commander's intent. It is a noble mission, is it not? That's pretty cool. Preach the message, heal the sick, raise the dead, and drive out demons. That's pretty incredible. Nothing but good going on there. And then Jesus says this. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Now imagine a shepherd, a literal shepherd, staff and all, and he's got this pen filled with these lovable little lambs, this beautiful sheep, and it's just, just as white as could be, right? As white as snow. And outside of the pen, there's all kinds of running around the meadows and in the forest surrounding a bunch of wolves. You can see their eyes at night. And the shepherd opens the gate to send the sheep out into the hillside. This is the imagery that Jesus is using here. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. I am sending you behind enemy lines. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And we like that last part, don't we? 
That's the Jesus that we know and love. Jesus, the innocent, the innocent as doves, the bundle of love. He's like, he's like a baby bunny. He's just so cute and so loving and so fun. Think about it. When you read the Gospels and you imagine what it was like when Jesus walked the earth, what do you see? Let's be honest with ourselves. We see, if, if you're like me, a clean, well-kept set of buildings with manicured dirt roads and walkways and perfectly placed stones here or there. The be beautiful Judean countryside, an olive grove, clean clothes, smiling faces. And it's literally always sunny. Now, I don't know why that image is in my head, but it is. And likely, because that's whenever we've seen imagery that's been put onto film in one way or another, that's the image that's portrayed. But what we don't see is what happened in Matthew chapter 2, right after the Magi left. It was genocide. Mary and Joseph took Jesus and they fled to Egypt to escape the blood that was going to flow through the streets as every two-year-old boy, two years old and under, throughout Bethlehem and the region, was killed by their government. In John 7, verse 1, Jesus did not want to go into Judea because, and I quote, the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. They didn't want to intimidate or ridicule or make fun of or malign him. They wanted to snuff him out. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. He had a shriveled hand. And Jesus dared to heal on the Sabbath. It incensed the Jewish leaders so badly. And again, I quote, that the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Jesus lived his entire life behind enemy lines, and he knew it. In Luke chapter 22, we see something very interesting. It's couched right there in the upper room next to the sacrament that we're going to partake in later this morning. He's gone through the Lord's Supper. We've shared the meal. We've shared the bread and the cup. And then Jesus refers back to that time in Matthew chapter 10 when he told them that he was going to send them out like sheep among wolves. And this time he asked this question. He said, when I sent you without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And he said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Now, what's going on here? What, what's different between Matthew 10 and Luke 22? Now remember, this is the Last Supper. This is the upper room. Jesus is about to get arrested and tried and beaten and tortured and killed. Jesus knows that he's leaving them. This time when they go out among wolves, he will not be there. The mission is serious now. That one before, that was kind of a trial run. I wanted you to see what it was going to be like. But I'm not going to be by your side physically this time. And you're going to need your purse. You're going to need some money. And you're going to need a bag. And yes, you are going to need a sword. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a sword, sell your only protection from the elements to get one. That's what cloaks were. I mean, it got cold at night. A cloak protected you from the elements. And he said, you, you, you need to have a sword more than you need to have your cloak. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. You see, Jesus knew that he was about to be tried as a criminal and killed for it. The Jewish leaders were going to get their way. 
And he knew that anyone associated with his movement would be guilty by association. He was basically saying, gentlemen, from now on, you will be living on the lamb as criminals. You will be living behind enemy lines, and that will be the norm for you from here on out. Be ready and be smart. That's what shrewd means. It means to be smart. And as you share the gospel message with everyone you meet, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent doves. To be shrewd is to be thoughtful, to be smart, to be wise. To be shrewd is to be strategically cunning. Keep your eyes open. Know that the enemy is lurking in the shadows, prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, as Peter tells us. Now, I believe it's important to note that Jesus does not instruct the disciples to take the safe route. Safety is not the number one priority here. And I think we as Christians need to take serious note of that. Safety is not the number one priority. The mission is. And to accomplish this mission, Jesus showed them how to be strategically cunning, both here and really throughout his entire ministry. He doesn't tell them to hole up or to hide. He tells them they're out to get you. Be aware of this and just be smart. Be shrewd. He has been very direct about the consequences that are ahead of them. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 10. This was this is while Jesus was still with him. This is on the trial run that Jesus says this. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Flogged. On my account, you will be brought before government governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Be smart. This is not your typical Sunday school Jesus. Now, there are a number of stories in the Bible that show Jesus modeling how to be strategically cunning because it was a part of his character. Time, unfortunately, does not allow us to list them all, let alone unpack them, but think about a couple of them. His conversation with the woman at the well. That was strife with scandal and potential for just really bad things to happen. A Jewish man alone with an adult, a, a woman who was, shall we call her rather loose, hanging out at a public well, a Samaritan no less. He had to be very, very careful and shrewd in the way that he approached her and the way that he conversed with her. How about his approach to the men that were poised to stone the adulterous woman? He starts to draw on the ground, engaging them and in, in distracting them and trying to figure out how to, how to prevent what is about to happen from happening. His wisdom, when he was asked whether or not Jews should pay taxes to the Roman government, he was asked by a Pharisee and a Herodian, two differing opposing political views that were all a part of his Jewish audience. And if he offended one of them, he'd lose 50% of his audience. The Pharisees were anti-Roman government. They did not like to pay taxes. And the Herodians were kind of, you know, they're, it's you know, a means to an end. We're going to kind of play nice with Caesar so that we can get our way in a couple areas. So they were okay with paying taxes. And they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, should we pay our taxes? That's when he pulls out the coin, says, whose image is on the coin? Oh, it's Caesar's. Well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And just amazingly brilliant and shrewd. The times he slipped from the crowds when they were trying to entrap him. Or very generally speaking, how he constantly maneuvered throughout the region in broad daylight with a price on his head. There were people that hated him. 
wanted to kill him, and he's still engaged in public ministry. Jesus didn't get caught until God's precise timing allowed him to be caught. Which leads us to the most strategically cunning move of God's entire battle plan. The move that we remember and we celebrate every Easter season and every time that we take communion with one another. It was a move the enemy didn't see coming. It was a move made all the more glorious because it looked like the enemy had scored the ultimate victory and won the war. But in reality, it sealed his ultimate defeat. It was brilliant. I mentioned this before, and I'm just going to go for it today, so hope you'll bear with me. But the musical artist Carmen, way back in, I think it was the early 90s, late 80s, he gave us a relatively cheesy rendition of this cosmic play's conclusion in, this, in his song called The Champion. Now, it's as cheesy as I'll get out, but it gets me every time. And I would just like to share with you the lyrics of it as we see, again, this cosmic play unfolding. It goes like this. In the vast expanse of a timeless place where silence ruled the outer space, ominously towering it stood the symbol of a spirit war between the one named Lucifer and the morning star, the ultimate of good. Enveloped by a trillion planets, clean as lightning and hard as granite, a cosmic coliseum would host the end of the war between the Lord of sin and death and the omnipotent creator of man's first breath. Who will decide who forever will be the champion? The audience for the fight of the ages was assembled and in place. The angels came in splendor from a star. The saints that had gone on before were there, Jeremiah, Enoch, Job. They were singing the song of Zion on David's harp. The demons arrived, offensive and vile, cursing and blaspheming God, followed by their trophies dead and gone, Hitler, Napoleon, Pharaoh, Capone, tormented and vexed and grieved, waiting for their judgment from the throne. Then a chill swept through the mammoth crowd and the demon squealed with glee as a sordid, vulgar, repulsive essence was felt. Arrogantly prancing, hands held high, draped in a sparkling shroud, trolled the demons, Satan ascended from hell. Then Satan cringed, the sinners groaned, the demons reeled in pain as a swell of power like silent thunder rolled with a surge of light beyond intense illuminating the universe in resplendent glory appeared the son of God. Then a persona, yes, extraordinaire, appeared in center ring. God the father will oversee the duel. Opening the book of life, each grandstand hushed in awe as majestically he said, now here's the rules. He will be wounded for their transgression, bruised for their iniquities. When he said by his stripes they're healed, the devil shook. He screamed, sickness is my specialty. I hate that healing junk. This is where it gets cheesy. God said, you shut your face. I wrote the book. Then the father looked at his son and said, you know the rules. Your blood will cleanse their sins and calm their fears. Then he pointed his finger at Satan and said, and you know the rules. You've been twisting them to deceive my people for years. Satan screamed, I'll kill you, Christ. You'll never win this fight. The demons wheezed, that's right, there ain't no way. Satan jeered, you're dead meat, Jesus. I'm gonna bust you up tonight. It was, I'm sorry, it was the early 90s. And Jesus said, go ahead, make my day. The bell rang, the crowd cheered, the fight was on, and the devil leaped in fury. With all his evil tricks, he came undone, and he threw his jabs of hate and lust, a stab of pride and envy, but the hand that knew no sin blocked every one. Forty days and nights they fought, and Satan couldn't touch him. Now the final blow, save for the final round, prophetically, Christ's hands came down, and Satan struck in vengeance. The blow of death fell Jesus to the ground. The devils roared in victory. The saints, shocked 
and perplexed as wounds appeared on his hands and feet. Then Satan kicked him in his side and blood and water flowed. And they waited for the 10 count of defeat. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The 10 count would proclaim the battle's end. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror yet as God started to count by saying, 10. Hey, wait a minute, God. Nine. Stop, you're counting wrong. Eight. His eyes are moving. Seven. His fingers are twitching. Six. Where's all this light coming from? Five. He's alive. Four. No. Three. And yet two. Oh, yes. One. And then the chorus comes in. He is one. He is one. He is alive forevermore. He is risen. He is Lord. And as cheesy as that song is, it does such an amazing job of laying out this cosmic battle and the just incredible strategically cunning way that God, in a sense, tricked the enemy. This, this is the strategically cunning victory that we celebrate every Easter. This is the strategically cunning victory that we celebrate every communion Sunday. And it should be the strategically cunning victory that we celebrate each and every single day. So we're going to do something right now. I'm not going to go into much more elaboration because time, again, is not on our side. But we're going to, I asked you to, to grab something that you could break for bread. I have a Pop-Tart. And Jesus, when he was with his disciples in that last supper room, in the upper room, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, break it, take it, eat in remembrance of me. So let's do that together. We take the bread, remembering Christ's body. And then he took the cup. I have some, some tea. Jesus had wine, a common drink of the day. And he said, this, is, this cup represents my blood shed for you. That blood that had to be shed so that you could have forgiveness of sins that would purify you, that it would allow you to come before a holy God. That's what this is all about. That's what this whole thing's all about. Jesus had to die to shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins and then to be raised again three days later so that we might have the hope of eternal life and show that he had power over sin and death. And so we drink in remembrance of his blood. And when we do that, when we take the bread and the cup together, we do it on the first Sunday of each month. We could do it more often if we wanted to. But whenever we do that, we celebrate this victory together as a body and as a communion with one another and with God. Here is the the conclusion, if you will, of all that we've been talking about today. You and I are behind enemy lines. That's the norm. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to acknowledge it, but we must. It is the clear message of Jesus to his disciples. It is clear every time we turn around. We have governments, we have policies, we have neighbors, we have family members, we have friends, we have co-workers, we have enemies, we have, we have all kinds of people around us that disagree with our thinking about Jesus. And there's a good portion of those that could be labeled as, according to the spiritual battle that we're in, as enemies. 
and they want nothing less than our message and our way of life to go away. And Jesus was trying to prepare us for that. We live behind enemy lines. That will change the way that you live. That will change the, the, the urgency of putting on armor, the armor of God, and of living as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. We must heed Jesus' instruction and be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. This is how Jesus lived his life. This is how he calls his disciples to live their lives. And may such a perspective add insight into the way that we perceive and engage with our Redeemer, our friend, our warrior leader, Jesus the Christ. And may we seek to emulate the deepening character of Christ as his representation on this earth in a myriad of ways. In childlike playfulness, in extravagant generosity, in disruptive honesty, in unashamedly scandalous love for others, and our, in our strategically cunning mindset that understands the times and navigates treacherous waters with skill and with intention. I told you it was not going to be your normal Easter Sunday message today. I hope that it falls on our hearts and our minds and our ears in a way that can stick with us, that we're softened enough in our hearts to hear God's love coming in and through the message of his word this morning. Have a wonderful rest of your holiday, and I pray that we would begin and, and continue to open our, our perspective of who Jesus is, to not just look through the kitchen window, but to peer through and to look outside and see the vast horizon and dimension of who Jesus is, because he's pretty incredible. Blessings to you. Have a, again, have a wonderful rest of your Easter holiday, a wonderful week, and hope to see you next week as we conclude this series, Everyday Jesus. Blessings to you all. Bye-bye now.